Hello, welcome. Hi, everyone. If you are so inclined, use the chat to tell us where you are tuning in from as we let some people log in and then we'll get started. Seattle, Shoreline, Everett. Oh, my cat just walked in the room. That's exciting. New Hampshire, Woodenville, Los Angeles. Excellent. Super excited. I'm super excited too. Bellingham and Ballard, Boston. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Bay Area, Lake Stevens, Victoria, BC. Oh, this is awesome, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm gonna give this just a few more seconds and then we will get started. Montlake Terrace, Finney Ridge, New York City. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Westchester County, hello, welcome. All right. I think that we are leveling off a little bit now, so I am going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington. It's called Book Larder. We are in Fremont in Seattle. We have a kitchen in our shop. And in normal times, this is the kind of event that we would have done in our store where Erin would have done a demonstration, we'd have samples of what she made ready to go, and we'd all get to chat and enjoy that. Um, we're going to do the next best thing in the current circumstances. And the wonderful thing about this is that we get to welcome so many more of you and people from all over the country and, and the world really uh, to these author talks and give a much broader audience the opportunity to learn about these wonderful cookbooks and to get to ask an author like Erin very important questions. We are of course here to celebrate Erin um, McDowell's latest book, The Book on Pie. It is a New York Times bestseller, which is an extraordinary achievement that puts her in a rarefied group. I think Ina Garten might be one of the only other cookbook authors on the list at the moment. Um, so um, she is going to be in conversation with Seattle chef and longtime friend of Book Larder, Rachel Coyle. Rachel is of course the founder and head pastry chef at Coyle's Bake Shop in, here in Seattle. The two of them are going to talk about pie. Erin is going to make a butterscotch apple pie that sounds amazing. And we are of course going to leave time for your questions. Mm -hmm. So if you could, please use that little Q&A button um, for your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can near the end of the talk. The book is, of course, available for sale on the Book Larder website, booklarder.com. We do have copies in stock and we have more coming tomorrow. So if you are thinking of gifts, please feel free to order from us. Um, it is December 6th or 7th, excuse me. So if you are, I would say, east of the Mississippi, you might want to consider one of the shipping options besides media mail if you are going to order the book. Um, we're we're cutting, starting to cut it a little bit close if you want it for Christmas. All right, so I am going to now turn things over to Erin McDowell and Rachel Coyle. Hello. Hello. Hi, Erin, how are you? I'm so good, how are you? Good, I'm excited to get to be uh, in your kitchen. I've followed you on Instagram for years now, so this is, uh, this is an exciting moment. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's, um... A rather humble and uh, messy kitchen at the moment. I'm not gonna lie, I was making Christmas cookies right before our, our talk tonight. So nice. Nice. there's stuff in every corner as per usual, but I'm especially excited to be making a delicious pie with you this evening, so. Awesome, awesome. Well, I know you're gonna jump into the demo, but I just wanted to ask real quick before you get started, because obviously you have a ton of baking experience. And I know that you're, you know, you're very, very uh, experienced in a lot of areas, but what kind of made pies loom large and, and kind of become the subject of this book? Well, pies are very special to me because they're one of the first things that I really learned how to make. Um, I always say that one of the first things I 
they're really one of the first things I learned how to bake, but they're really the first thing that I learned to bake without really needing a recipe, which of course in baking isn't a, so easy of a thing to do, but pies are just incredibly versatile and adaptable. If it's got filling and a crust, it's a pie and you yep. can do so much within that spectrum. And um, my family loved eating pies. We would sometimes drive significantly out of our way on road trips and trips just to get the perfect slice. And I baked my first pies with my grandma Jean when I was about 14 years old. And it started as just something, you know, a way to pass the afternoon more or less. We were going to um, an event and she wanted to bring that pie to the event. Mm -hmm. But from the moment I walked in the door carrying that pie and everybody's eyes went and locked right on that pie, I was completely hooked. I just thought I wanna make things for the rest of my life that can make both kids get excited, but like adults get these bright eyes like their kids almost. Yeah. And yeah. Um, ever since pies have been really, really special to me. And I also feel that people don't take the opportunity to get as creative with them as they might with some things like cookies and cakes. So that was really the inspiration for taking a deeper dive into one of my favorite subjects. Totally, totally, which the book does um, for sure. Um, well, I don't want to delay you. You're going to be starting on the apple butterscotch pie. Is that right? Yeah, I'm actually, so I'm going to be switching our camera around a little bit because I want to make sure everybody gets the best view possible. I've been okay. hoping this over several months now. So we <laughs> It, it looks a little ridiculous, but it works. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch us over and I'll start making the pie dough first. Fantastic. So I make my pie dough with um, all butter and this is just a single pie crust recipe, but of course you could double or um, triple or even quadruple this recipe if you wanted to make more if you're making a double crust pie or a few different pies. And um, I'm a baker, so I like to deal in grams. And that's one thing for those people who are considering the book. The book has both volume measurements and weight measurements in grams because that's just so wonderfully accurate in the world of baking. Um, I'm cutting my stick of butter. I cut it in half lengthwise and then I rotated it and cut it in half again. Basically, I'm cutting it into half inch cubes. And I just took this out of the refrigerator. It needs to be nice and cold. Number one rule of pie dough, when in doubt, chill it out. We want it nice and cold at every single stage of the process. So in the bowl, we have 150 grams, which is one and a quarter cups, all purpose flour. And we also have a little bit of fine sea salt. I use fine sea salt just because I find in baking recipes, it disperses a little bit more evenly, um, but of course it's fine to use other salt. And if you even wanted to use salted butter in your recipe, you could leave the salt out and go with salted butter instead. And I have one stick, um, 113 grams of cold unsalted butter. And just to clarify, this is the all butter dough from, from the book, yes. right? This okay. Is butter dough. And um, the first thing I do is just kind of toss all the cubes to make sure they're fully coated. One of the most misunderstood things with all butter pastry is that um, the butter needs to be fully coated in flour at all times. If it is not fully coated at any stage, it's at risk of melting out of the crust. So we kind of just constantly want to be tossing it and making sure that it's coated. And then in pastry school, you know, they teach us that the technical term for this is cutting in or rubbing in, but my nieces have a great term for this that I like, which is squishing the butter. Um, so we, we're going to now squish the butter and um, we just squish it between your fingers and your thumb kind of to kind of make these flat shingly bits. And um, one of the most, the second most misunderstood things about pastry dough is that the size that the fat is incorporated is going to determine the final texture. So I talk about a bunch of different things like this in the book. In fact, in a moment, I'll open it up to this picture and, and show everyone. Um, I, I know what you're talking about and I, it's, it was one of my favorite pages. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like for a lot of people, it'll be like a real light bulb moment of like, oh, these are all acceptable, but they just yield different results. So yes, yes. and yeah. um, you can't see my face, but I'm getting really excited on the oh, good. <laughs> I 
just love um, that it's something that people don't understand and it's the exact same recipe. My rough puff pastry recipe is the exact same as my all butter pie dough. It's just how you manipulate the dough that changes everything. And it's so cool that it does that. It's just really neat. So um, you can mix the fat until the size, of, you can mix it in fully, like really, really incorporated. Um, and you can even do that in a food processor. And that, uh, I call that dough for decor. Um, basically, it'll retain sharp edges of things like cutouts better. It'll hold braids and other elements like that a little bit better. So that's dough for decor. Mixing it to about the size of peas, about this size, or um, actually oh, maybe even a little smaller. Let's be, let's, what, what's a pea? <laughs> so like about, about in this vein, um, I call that mealy pie dough when the butter is mixed into about this size. Um, and I tend to use that for pies with uh, wetter fillings like uh, cream pies or uh, even custard pies sometimes like pumpkin or pecan. And then when you leave the butter the size of walnut halves about like this, that's what you get for flaky pie dough. And the reason that that works is basically you, when the cold chilled fat hits the heat of the oven, it creates the moisture inside the fat just kind of immediately evaporates producing this little puff of steam. And that puff of steam is what makes those flaky layers. So um, I also have methods in the book, my extra flaky method and my rough puff pastry which you start the process the same as for making pie dough, but you add these folds to the process, which are very simple. It's just rolling out the dough and folding it in quarters, but it creates this incredible flakiness. And I do want to point that out to the viewers tonight because people who struggle with the fat melting out of their pie dough, that extra flaky method is really helpful for making sure as you roll out and and fold, you kind of make sure that all that fat is coated well in flour and you're not gonna risk as much that experience of it melting out. So I made a little well in the center and I'm gonna start adding water. And um, I always have to talk about this because um, my book has some dreaded words in the pie dough recipe, which is plus more as needed <laughs> at the end of this water addition. And that's because every um, type of flour hydrates a little differently. And um, even, you know, even within, so we're talking all purpose hydrates differently than whole wheat, hydrates differently than um, pastry and cake flour. And it's because of the protein content, largely that they hydrate differently. But without telling you a specific brand of flour to use, it's very difficult for me to predict the exact level of hydration. And the story that I always tell is my mother, I'm from Kansas originally, and my mother uses a brand of flour that's local to Kansas. It's, made, it's called Hudson Cream Flour. And because it's milled and grown in Kansas, its footprint is much shorter and therefore it's very inexpensive in the grocery stores. It's only about um, 250 a bag for a five pound bag or something crazy like that. My mom is never gonna use another brand of flour other than Hudson cream. And if my own mother will not use a brand that I recommend, I tend to think that there are probably other people out there that wanna use whatever kind of flour they have on hand as well. So I would much rather give you the visual cues. And also, you know, some people nowadays are milling their own flour and there's all these amazing things that we can do. So the um, best part about pie is that you can make it with any kind of flour, really. So um, just kind of learning those visual cues and how to handle the hydration is really, really helpful in learning to use all those different ones. Um, as I'm adding this water, I'm tossing it rather than kind of stirring or kneading it. And I'm also looking for clumps like this clump right here. Sometimes water kind of clings to certain areas. So I like to divvy those up a little bit <laughs> and just keep, keep on mixing. Ooh, did I freeze? It looks like I might be frozen. On yeah. Mine. Sorry, guys. Let me, let me swap back. I don't know why it's doing that. Oh, of course now it's back. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you're back. 
I was just on a delay. Um, but basically I'm tossing rather than kneading and I'm breaking up some of those clumps so that I'm trying to disperse that water throughout rather than letting some parts of it get more hydrated than others. And at a certain point, you can see that it's starting to come together. But usually what happens when it starts to come together is there's still a lot of powdery stuff down here at the bottom. So what I like to do is I like to just set that part that's come together aside and then dip my fingers in my ice water and just kind of splash a little bit in with just my fingers. That enables me to only add a little bit and I'm also only adding it to the area that really needs it rather than continuing to just add water to a part that already has a good amount of water. And then now that we know we have a good amount of water, it's time to give it a little bit of a need, but I use the word need very, very loosely because it's just as much as we need to, to bring it together and no more. We don't want to overwork the dough. We want it nice and tender and, and flaky. And the goal is it should just come together and just hold together. It will not be totally smooth or, or anything like that. And when you put your hand flat on it, you should be able to pull it up without like a bunch of, obviously my fingertips still have gunk on them, but the palm of my hand, it's coming up without anything sticking to it. And that's a sign that the dough is well hydrated. And, I love that. That's a really great, great trick. Cause I think like remotely, it's really hard to convey, you know. It's hard. Yeah. I'm just rinsing off my hands here and then I'll, I'll put it back on my face for a moment here, but um, it is hard to convey it. And actually before I put it, let me give you another close up here, kind of what that should look like. Yeah, good, good amount of butter in there. Oh yeah, baby, all butter all the time. Yep. And if you wanted to do those folds I was talking about, you could just um, give it a little bit of a chill at this stage. Uh, you know, at least 30 minutes. And then you can just roll it out and perform those folds. They do obviously then add a smidge more time to the dough making process, but it's a really more foolproof method, especially for people who consistently struggle with that fat melting out in the oven, which is a problem no baker wants to have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this dough will need to be chilled. And of course I have some that's already ready to go and I'm just gonna bring it out and um, and we'll roll it out. And uh, this particular crust requires par baking. So I like to talk a little bit about the difference between par and blind baking, at least as I see it, because there are sort of some differing <laughs> definitions out there. Um, par baking stands for partially baking a crust before filling it with a filling that needs to be baked again. And blind baking is when you fully bake a crust before adding a filling that does not need to be baked again. So both of these processes are, are fairly similar, but um, just, you know, one takes longer than the other to get complete. And um, I pretty much par bake any single crust pie. So this pie included. It's very difficult for a pie crust to bake fully in the amount of time it takes for a filling to set, especially when it's weighed down by that filling and that filling is heavy and full of moisture. And um, so we're just giving the crust a head start to make sure that it is very flaky and that's what we want and no soggy bottoms. <laughs> yes, well, and I think this is always a good time to bring up uh, par baking and blind baking right after Thanksgiving, after you know people have made their pumpkin pies and maybe some of them have had a soggy bottom and they wanna know how to how to prevent that in the future. Absolutely, and then I also hear every year from a couple of people who tell me that they tried the par baking and they missed the soggy bottom. <laughs> they liked it. Okay. Yeah, there's... <laughs> I, I am not team soggy bottom, but you know what? To each their pumpkin pie own. And uh, you know, as long as you're eating pie, not, not too bad of a situation, I don't think. Um, I'll switch you back overhead while I roll this out and we can see see that view. And how cold is the dough? It is nice and chilled. It's been in the refrigerator. I actually made this dough this morning, so it's been in the refrigerator, you know, all day. But um, 
you would want at least 30 minutes before doing any folds and kind of my preferred time is an hour. In the book, I actually have that, there's a page where um, I talk about chill times and I say my preferred chill time, the minimum and the maximum so that you can kind of know how far ahead you can get if you're trying to get ahead and also, um, and also where, uh, you know, if you're trying to scrape by with the bare minimum, how much I think you can get away with it with that as well. And um, I'm just gonna roll out this dough. I'm trying to use as minimal flour as I need to, to roll it out. Um, just because my hydration was on point. So I should only need enough to kind of keep it from sticking to the surface. And another thing that I'm doing to help prevent it sticking from the surface is I'm just moving it around a lot. Um, just kind of shifting the dough and um, that helps prevent it from sticking just as well. And we don't have to add more flour to do it. Are there uh, any questions thus far that I can answer? I know we're saving them for the end, but if there's anything while I'm doing this rolling out, I, I could take one if you'd like. There is one. Um, actually, there are two. Um, one person would like to know, uh, do you need to think about overworking the dough when you're folding? That's a good question. Um, typically, it's not, a, it's not an issue. Um, and uh, it's because at that stage, kind of what you're doing is building strength rather than, than you're not mixing. Once the dough, let me, that's a better way to put it. Once the dough is hydrated, you're not as concerned about overworking it as you are during the actual mixing phase. Because once you've hydrated the dough, that's when it risks getting a smidge tough. Um, you know, gluten doesn't always have to be a dirty word. And in that sense, uh, those folds don't harm it. And instead it disperses the butter more evenly, which can actually make the dough even more tender, which is really lovely. Any brand of butter that you like to use? I confess I use so much butter. I typically go for whatever's on sale. But the main thing that you can remember is that American butters have a slightly lower fat content than European butters which makes European butters a little bit more difficult to work with. They're a little more prone to melting, um, but at the same time, they also taste amazing and have a beautiful color. So it's kind of a give and take on both sides. Yeah. Um, just using the rolling pin to roll the dough up here, and then I'm gonna use that to transfer it. All right, so speaking of the rolling pin, and then I will jump off, you use a tapered rolling pin, any reason why? Nancy would like to know the answer to that. Great question, Nancy. Um, I personally think that all hand tools are a complete personal preference. So I like a tapered French style pin because it allows me more easily to apply pressure to only one area if I need to. Um, I like how lightweight it is, but still very sturdy to roll things out and get the job done. So that, but that's my personal preference. I know plenty of pie bakers who love a handled rolling pin. And uh, my, I'm a big believer that there is not just one right way to do things. So if you like it with a handled pin, I say, go for it. I learned to bake pies using a handled rolling pin, but I, I sure like this French style tapered pin now. So after I get it in the crust, I sort of make sure that it's fully touching the base and sides. And I do that by kind of gently lifting up the sides and pushing down. Um, and then I use scissors, assuming I can find my scissors that I had placed out, here they are. I use scissors to trim my pie crust so that there's just about a half an inch excess from the edge all the way around the pie plate. Do you trim a different amount if you're using, uh, if you're making a double crust pie? I don't, um, I trim about the same amount, but what I do is I don't trim until the top and the bottom are, till the top crust is on basically. And then what I do is I press really firmly to adhere that top crust to the bottom crust and kind of thin it out a little bit more, then I trim it. So that way there, you have the excess, but it's only slightly thicker than, than it would be with a single crust pie like this. Yeah. And um, now I'm going to tuck the excess dough under itself all the way around. So I pick up the dough and I tuck it under 
Ooh, this looks so good on the overhead cam. I'm so glad you guys can see that because this is one of my <laughs> steps. Um, what we're doing is we're building this little pie crust retaining wall, more or less, that we're adding a little more heft to the um, to the the side of the crust, which is going to make it less likely to shrink down. But it's also going to allow our crimps to hold a little bit better because we we have a little more dough to actually crimp. And um, that's really important. Sometimes I see people trying to crimp this very minuscule amount of dough at the edge, and then they're wondering why the crimp shape doesn't hold. And I think sometimes you just need a little more dough to make the shape, you know, stick exactly the way that you want it to. So we tuck it under all the way around. And I'm just kind of using my thumb to press after I tuck it. And you could actually just stop here and kind of straighten it out with your hands like this, running your, your fingers along to straighten it out a little. Or you could um, move on to uh, crimping it. And I'll just show you really quickly a classic finger crimp, my favorite to do. Um, if you're left-handed, you of course would be going the other way, but your dominant hand makes kind of a V shape and your non-dominant hand pushes towards your hand and also down towards the pie plate. So the wider this outside finger is, the more uh, rustic the crimp will be. So like if I left my hands out more like this, I would obviously make a much wider crimp. But if I leave my fingers more narrow, it makes a more refined crimp. And you just keep going all the way around the pie. If you were gonna add, so this is my only crimp that I do, the one that you're doing. If I were gonna add one more to my repertoire, what would you? Oh, one of my other favorites that's so easy is the rope crimp where you push the dough between your two fingers like this. Some people oh. also do this one handed with their thumb. For some reason, I cannot make that work. So um, just another reminder, there's not just one right way to do things, there's lots. <laughs> So you kind of put your finger down where the last crimp ends and put your other finger parallel to it and pinch the dough between it. And it makes this kind of beautiful scalloped edge. That's so beautiful. yeah, it's really a lovely, lovely crimp. One of my other favorites. And then we would fill it. Um, this is really important. Let me show you this, I guess. I would dock this dough all over with a fork, pierce the, um, pierce the dough all over with a fork to make tiny little holes. That helps prevent the dough from puffing up too much in the oven. Then um, after chilling it for a little bit of time, I would line it with parchment paper and fill it to this top edge with pie weights. And um, this is pretty important because uh, a lot of people just put pie weights in the base. And it needs to not only weigh down the base of the pie, but also support the sides. So that's why sometimes pie crust shrinks down the sides of your pan. It's just because there isn't enough support um, and it just wants to slide on down. So you uh, line it with the parchment and you would par bake it. Um, and when it comes out, it looks like this. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Magic. So it's... Um, it's you know golden brown at the edges and it looks kind of set in the base. Uh, once it cools, you can also do my favorite pie party trick, which is actually kind of rotate it in the pan. And then, then that's a good sign that it's not sticking. And then you can just pop it right on out and make sure that it's properly par baked, which it is. So now we've got this crust and we're ready to make some fillings. And while we make fillings, we can chat a little bit more because I have to be right up here by the stove with you. <laughs> hello. So, hello. So I'm gonna start making the apple filling. The cool thing about this pie, and there are a few pies in the book that are like this, it's a layered pie. So um, I start with a layer of apple pie filling that you bake. And then once it cools, we make a butterscotch pudding that we put on top. And I'm, I've got it all ready to make both, but I figure we can just chat and we'll see how far I get here in the process of making these. And I'll give you a couple glimpses in the process as well. Um, I like to pre-cook my 
pie, my fruit pie fillings. I mean, it's not an exclusive rule, but I really like to. And it's partially because it really helps to regulate the moisture content um, to help make sure that we don't get a runny filling. And um, so this is a really simple pie filling. It's a little bit of butter, 14 ounces. Um, so that's almost 400 grams of apples. I like um, uh, honey crisp apples a lot. On the West Coast, you guys are very lucky to also get that it's just kind of, it's harvest time. So I know it's in the stores. One of my other favorite apples, which is called Cosmic Crisp, which is a hybrid of um, Honey Crisp and I think Enterprise. But anyway, it's a delicious, really big, juicy apple that I love for baking. Um, and then it has brown sugar, um, some spices, cinnamon and nutmeg and uh, vanilla, salt, and then it's thickened with a little bit of flour. And you, it only takes about five minutes to cook it to the desired consistency, maybe a little more, seven-ish. And then I make sure I cool it before I put it into the par-baked crust, but otherwise it's a pretty simple process and it makes the most delicious caramel apple filling. It's like everything is coated in this like caramel sauce and it's so, so good. So I'll aim my camera down here in a minute and show you, but I just wanted to get it started before I do. So for this pie, are you, are you cooking it on the stove and then adding, putting it, once it's cooled, putting it in the par-baked crust and then baking that whole, those two yeah. items together. Okay. So then that pie will be baked for about, um, it'll be baked at 400 degrees. And let me see what my exact time is so I don't misquote myself. 35 to 40 minutes is what the author of this book says <laughs> wisely and has been tested many times, but uh, doesn't remember it off the top of her head. Um, and like I said, the pre-cooking of the apple filling really doesn't add that much time to the process, but it also, it kind of assures that whether you're using a really juicy apple like Cosmic Crisp or whether you're using a less juicy apple like Granny Smith, it would still work and taste delicious, but you're going to get a really consistent consistency. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It already smells really, really good. So I start by cooking the brown sugar and the spices and everything with it for just a few minutes until it starts to pull the moisture out of the apples. Um, sugar is hygroscopic. And so it pulls moisture out of things. And that's another thing that is like the advantage of pre-cooking. Um, another common technique that if you wanted to not pre-cook where you can still kind of take advantage of that is by macerating the fruit before you prepare your filling and kind of pulling some of the moisture out of it. And then if necessary, if it has a lot of juiciness, you can reduce that moisture down. Um, these are some of the things that I've done for years, especially like when you're lucky in the summer and you have really, really ripe, juicy everything. And it's like so yeah. perfect for pie baking. Yeah. Yeah. And it all shows up at once. <laughs> yes. All at the exact same time. And it's just yeah. like make pies now or else. <laughs> I do actually have instructions in the book for um, freezing fruit at its ripest and, and some of those things as well. So um so you can kind of get some, some tips for that. I'm just gonna put this under the overhead cam really quick and show you what it looks like. So you can see it's already pulled a lot of the moisture out of the apples and made this kind of saucy situation. So now we'll add the, uh, the last little bit of sugar and the flour. And I like to mix the starch and the sugar together a little bit. Um, the granules of the sugar help to disperse the starch, which is helpful when you're adding it to something that's already hot um, right. because starch likes to clump up so much. And then we'll just cook it until it's kind of our desired thickness. It usually only takes a minute or two. I usually let it come to like, you know, a little bit of a simmer. Um, you know, fruit fillings that use a thickener like flour or cornstarch, that thickener isn't fully activated until that mixture comes to a boil. So that's another common problem that people make with fruit pies. If they're not pre-cooking the filling and they don't get the filling to boil in the oven, then they cut into the pie and it's soup. 
But um, again, that's one really good way to avoid it. Yeah, and it might have had enough thickener. Just exactly. Uh, you have a question about. So you mentioned flour and cornstarch. What are the main sort of thickeners that you prefer that you like to use in the book? So I, I largely stuck with flour and cornstarch in the book. I really like flour when I want the filling to have a little bit more of that like sauciness rather mm -hmm. than like jamminess. For jamminess, yeah. I go for cornstarch. Yeah. Um, I just had a fa fascinating conversation. I was on a pie panel with several other um, pie experts and you know, two people preferred cornstarch. I said flour and cornstarch, and then two people said they preferred tapioca starch. And I yeah. also like tapioca starch, and I confess that the only reason, it's much more readily available now. The only reason I've strayed away from it for years is I've been a recipe writer for a number of years, and it used to be harder for people to find. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of recipes that have been formulated, but the experts who loved it said that they felt that tapioca starch made it easier to get that ideal consistency. And I do kind of agree that with cornstarch, it can be a little bit of a fine line between just juicy enough and like, you know, kind of stodgy, as they would say yeah, yeah. on a British baking show. <laughs> yeah. You don't want any stodgy baked goods up in here. This is the, when I get a facial, my, my apple pie filling facial. I'll, um, I'm pouring this onto a sheet tray um, the increased surface area will help it cool a little bit faster. And that way I don't put it into my crust hot. If I do put it into my crust hot, we risk it kind of steaming up and making the crust soggy. So I'll show you under the overhead what, what the filling looks like here. Beautiful. Yeah, there's our filling, our first filling. And what we'll do is after that cools, we'll put it into the par baked crust We'll bake it for um, we'll bake it for the 35 to 40 minutes. We'll let that cool as well. But that makes this also a really good make ahead pie. It's kind of impressive, but you can divvy it up over. You know, you can make the dough one day. You could par bake the next day. You could take the filling and kind of divvy it up in more of a an easy way. Um, and then I'm going to start making the butterscotch pudding, which is also a very, very, very simple put basic pudding. It's um, some milk and some cream, uh, some dark brown sugar. That's what gives us the butterscotchy flavor without having to like make a full butterscotch sauce. Um, and then it's thickened with a mixture of cornstarch and egg yolks, has a little bit of salt, some vanilla and some butter. And it's a pretty simple stovetop pudding. Um, I actually already had somebody who has made this version several times just using jello pudding, butterscotch pudding over the top as well. But you know what? I'm not mad at it. You already made the rest of that pie homemade. So yeah. not to go semi homemade on it, but you know, <laughs> I love a pudding. So I'm just like, however you get from zero to pudding is really fine by me. Um, I love, I love pudding and I, uh, I think it's going to make a comeback. Like it's, uh, it's poised. I yeah. think that like in general stovetop desserts are sort of misunderstood as being like, like something our grandparents made. And I'm just right. like, no, actually they're really fast and easy. And you always have the things in your pantry. I feel like, um, yeah. so yeah, let's take some questions. If there are any good, like yeah. while, while this is simmering and coming to a boil and all that. So we have a few sort of hydration, I think, related questions. One is about avoiding shrinkage. Okay. And another is um, when you take the dough out of the fridge, if it's really hard, is that a hydration issue? So yes, the, to answer the, the latter question first, yes, if the dough is firm, it's usually underhydrated. Underhydrated dough will likely crack and even tear as you're trying to work with it. It's quite unpleasant. Um, and uh, I find underhydrated dough is a pretty common problem more so than overhydrated. It's almost as if the recipes we've been using and that our grandmas have passed down to us and some of those things have scared all of us collectively from adding too much water. And as a result, everyone is adding not enough. So I, if your dough is hard right out of the fridge, that could be one thing. It could also be that you keep your refrigerator really cold. Um, and that's something if you have control over that and you can like set a temperature in there to see what's going on, um, that can be helpful. 
Similarly, American butters, because they have a little lower fat content than European butters, they are going to set up firmer in the fridge than a dough made with European butter. So there are a couple different things going on, but no matter what, if it's properly hydrated, it should roll out really easily. Um, for the first question about the shrinking, 80% of the time, the shrinking issue is a result of not using enough pie weights. The other 20, if you're, if you're in a situation where you're using them, of course, but the rest of the time, it is a result of overworking the dough. Um, make sure you give the dough more time to relax and chill, and it shouldn't be an issue anymore. A couple questions about uh, pie dishes. Do you have a favorite material? So I prefer ceramic or metal. Those are my two favorites. Metal is the most nonstick, um, but both ceramic and metal do a good job of conducting heat to the base, which helps us get rid of those potential soggy bottoms. Uh, so that, those are my preference. Glass is my least favorite, um, but I still recommend it for beginners because um, they can kind of lift up the pie and actually just check the doneness. Under baking pies is another really common problem that I see. People are afraid of burning it and it feels like a really high temperature, but then if you don't bake a pie long enough, you'll have a soggy bottom and the, the filling might be runny and there are all these issues. So if you're nervous about those things or you're a beginner, glass can be great for that reason because you can see through it. You can actually just look and see is the bottom brown. And then a couple par baking questions. One about not getting the edges too brown and then another about, you know, how long do you usually par bake your crust for? Okay, so I par bake at 425 degrees uh, for 12 to 15 minutes or until the edges start to look golden and kind of the, the structure looks set, which um, what I mean by that is it has kind of a matte appearance to it rather than a raw or doughy appearance to it. Then um, uh, after the 12 to 15 minutes, you lift the pie weights out and you bake it for another two to four minutes until the base looks matte and set as well. If you're blind baking, instead of two to four minutes on the other end of that, it would be more like seven to nine, um, fully baking the crust and getting it all the way finished there. All right, and what about avoiding those extra brown edges? Yours looked so oh, yes. great. Yes, so um, for that, the they make these little, I've just always used foil if I've needed it uh, to tent any area that's getting a little dark for my liking, but they also make these really lovely silicone kind of shields that are adjustable and that you can put on the ends. And that for me is another really wonderful option because um, it really only wraps around the edges and I know that foil issue can be <laughs> kind of cumbersome, especially when you're dealing with a piping hot pie. All right, and you have time for one more? Or do you need to be? Uh... No, no, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stir this together while I answer one more. Keep, okay. Keep at me. I should have asked this with the favorite material. Do you have any tips for baking in a cast iron pan? Oh yes, I actually just wrote an article on this uh, for Field Company. So if you Google Field Company and pie, um, you can get my whole article on this, and it comes with three cast iron skillet pie recipes. I love and love baking in cast iron. Um, when you bake in cast iron, you can actually almost just count on skipping par baking um, because it conducts heat so well. And there are a few companies that make cast iron or forged iron pie plates as well. Um, I think Lodge makes a, camp, a cast iron pie plate that's actually like encouraged for use when camping. You know, it's like a camping pie plate. Um, I've never made a pie while camping, but sounds like an adventure. You want to do it at camp, right? <laughs> exactly. You got the camp crimping edges in the middle of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think you could do it in a cast iron skillet pretty easily. Sure. You can pie pretty easily in that sense, wherever you are. So, um, so, the, the filling that I made, that butterscotch filling, um, what I just basically, you cook it all together. You add the eggs kind of at the last moment and um, it just cooks till this really silky consistency. And then what I would do is I would pour it hot right over the cooled apple pie. And that way um, we get this kind of nice smooth layer. 
I cover the surface of it directly in plastic wrap and, um, and then we'll let it set until it's totally cool, which takes a couple of hours just to get it nice and firm and set. And then that's pretty much our pie. It gets topped with some whipped cream, which is of course the last delicious part, which I will do now. <laughs> We've got another magic, magic television swap. Sorry, I think I could actually answer one more question while I'm finishing up that whipped cream. I didn't mean to cut uh, you off. I, I think we had several questions about what you use for pie weights. Okay, great. I use um, ceramic pie weights myself, which are little, um, little ceramic balls that I buy from a kitchen supply store. Unfortunately, I've never understood why this is, but you need about four sets that are sold at a <laughs> kitchen supply store to actually fill your pie the, the way I suggest doing it. So my other two suggestions are of course, dried beans or any kind of grain you have in your house. You cannot cook those beans or um, grains or whatever you're using after um, after using them for pie weights, but you can use them as pie weights many times before you need to get rid of them. They sometimes get an off smell eventually. Um, I also really like Stella Parks's technique of using sugar. Um, I don't use it that much personally, but I tested it a lot for a colleague of mine and I really liked it because especially if you're making pie, you usually have sugar. Um, so it's a really nice, easy thing. And some people are afraid the sugar would melt in the oven, but actually it just kind of changes lightly in color. It becomes kind of golden and she calls it toasted sugar and you can use it in any kind of baking recipes moving forward. So it's kind of a fun, no waste way um, if you don't want to invest in all of those ceramic pie weights. Awesome. Yeah. What, what else for this what moment? Else? What are the other burning pie questions? <laughs> well, um, someone said they actually tried to Google that article that you mentioned and couldn't find it. So maybe it's just not posted yet. And I oh, just it's, to it's and I up, so I can look it up and put it in the chat here in one minute. Yeah, no, no worries. I, I, well, I can look it up again too. You know, you're baking. You shouldn't be looking things like that up. It was the field company. Yes, field okay. company. All right, I'll look it up again. Um, let's see. Oh, someone actually, I forgot to ask again with the hydration question. Is there a way to save under or over hydrated dough? Yes, um, over hydrated dough, unfortunately will often be very tough after, um, after baking. And that's just unfortunately kind of the, the byproduct of over hydrating it. But what you can do to combat that, I have it written in the book, it's in the dough chapter. Um, you can uh, use a little more flour to, during the rolling, kind of do the opposite of what I just suggested before, which was only using as much as you needed, and instead really go to town and use a good amount of flour. Um, and that dough is gonna absorb that flour as you work. It won't fully take away the problem of it being overly hydrated, but it'll be enough for you to work with it. The dough might be extra crisp, but it should still be a delicious dough. So no reason to like throw it out. The process for um, fixing an under hydrated dough is a little more complicated. I basically suggest rolling it out as best you can and spraying it or spritzing it lightly with water and performing one of those folds. That way, in the process of folding, you incorporate that water a little bit, and um, it just allows you to uh, to hopefully get some more moisture back in the process and, and hydrate the dough a little bit more. And in the process, you also make some more flakiness, so there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to switch to the overhead camera, but I'll keep taking questions. I'm just putting whipped cream on, and I want you guys, I don't want you to miss it. Did you put anything in your whipped cream before you whipped it? The book has several whipped cream recipes. So I have one that's like specifically meant for being super stable if you're trying to make it ahead of time um, that, has whip, that has cream cheese in it, which I know sounds crazy, but it makes it really thick and creamy and delicious and naturally stabilizes it, which is very cool. This one is just the classic whipped cream. In the book, there are also different flavored whipped creams and all the whipped creams come in three different 
quantities basically. So the half batch quantities, if you just wanted to pipe or spread some whipped cream around the edge, the full batch, which is what this is, it spreads evenly over the whole thing, or there's the mile high, which of course is piled nice and high. We all love a mile high pie. <laughs> Gorgeous. So I can actually, I can cut this and show you the inside and the layers and everything, um, but we, I can keep taking questions too. As you do that, we had a question about cutting pies and like what's your favorite knife to use so that you get a nice sort of sharp edge. Okay, so two things. My first favorite thing is that if you bake the pie properly, like I said, it should pop right out of the pie plate. So that's my first favorite thing is that makes it a lot easier to slice it if you're not trying to maneuver around the pan itself. Then the second thing I always say to do is to start by taking a small, I call it the sacrifice slice. And the sacrifice slice can be your snack for a pie well done, or it can go to that person who there always is one who says, I only want a little piece. <laughs> so it can go to either you or that person, you decide, but you just take a really skinny little piece, at least for me, that's a skinny piece. <laughs> and it just becomes much easier to remove subsequent pieces from the pie with that first piece out of there because you basically have literal wiggle room to get in there and get your, your slice out. So now when I go to slice it, woo. The, the beautiful Instagram cross section. Yeah, I'll, bring it, I'll bring it up to, this is what I have a, something going for anyone who's interested in joining. I'm calling it the sturdy pie challenge. And with the sturdy pie challenge, you should be able to lift your pie out of the pie plate, as I just showed you there, and also hold and eat a slice of pie like a pizza, if you are so inclined. So the sturdy pie challenge is passed here today. <laughs> Love it. And I have whipped cream on my finger, but that is, is just another job hazard, unfortunately. <laughs> I love that. It's the, um, it's the actual hand pie, right? Yes. Pressed all the way around just to eat it that way. Any pie is a hand pie if uh, if it's a sturdy pie. Erin, <laughs> a couple people wanted to know about gluten-free crusts. One says hers are always tough. And another just wanted to know if you had sort of general advice about working with gluten-free crusts. Yeah, so gluten-free crust, one of the problems is it's very easy to overhydrate it. So your crust might have just been tough because it was overhydrated. Um, so that's one thing I would suggest is kind of start by adding a little less than you think you need and just really mixing, starting with that tossing method and then only bringing it together at the end as needed and making sure you break up any clumps because um, that is a real problem with gluten-free dough. In general, I find that even my best gluten-free doughs are a little more crisp. They're still tender. Um, they're not quite as flaky. So um, they still are flaky. They're just, they, I never, even when I do it perfectly, I can never get it quite there. Um, so I think that the general advice that goes for a classic pie dough of using only as much flour as you need while rolling it out, handling it very minimally, all of those things kind of just go into overdrive when you're working with a gluten-free dough. You just want to be extra careful kind of at every stage to only use what you need to use both in ingredients and effort to kind of get it to the end result. Thanks. All right, and I'm gonna ask one more question. I'm sorry, everyone, we had lots of questions. Erin's book is a wonderful resource though, so you can always turn there and of course follow her on social or blog and all those places. Um, this one isn't so technical, but I, I thought it was good and then I'll let Rachel finish things up. You mentioned different members of your family a few times during the talk tonight. Are there recipes inspired by them in the book or are there favorite flavor combinations that they have from the book? Yes, so a lot of the recipes, if you read in the head note, will describe who they're inspired by. And some, I joked with one of my friends um, that if I've known you in the last like 20 years, you might have a pie in this book because there's a lot of people, people inspire my work a lot. I think of uh, the things that they would like or certain things kind of remind me of them, even if they've never explicitly told me that they like it. Um, and there are lots of those in the book. 
Um, one good example is actually my, it's not a family member, it's my, um, a f my best friend, Terry. Um, she has a pie in the book. She loves black raspberry and she has um, a black raspberry chiffon pie in the book that's sort of like dreamt up for her and with her in mind. Um, I believe my one of my other best friends in the whole world, Maggie, is lives in Seattle, and I think she's watching tonight. Um, she and I both love book, book larder, and um, and uh, I actually wrote in the book also about a very special afternoon that we had. We went to a crawfish boil at a friend's house in the yard, and I made a shrimp boil pie in the book that has all these elements of like a classic boil dinner, but on pie crust. And I had like a really lovely time, like thinking of those memories of that specific dinner party and everything to kind of dream that pie up. But the one that is probably the closest to my heart that's inspired by a family member is the very first full pie recipe in the book. It's in chapter three, fruit pies. And so it's the first uh, pie recipe that you come across. And um, it is the pure rhubarb pie because my grandma Jean, the one who taught me to make pie, um, she always said, you know, strawberry rhubarb is good, but there just aren't enough pure rhubarb pies. So I wanted to make sure that the very first um, recipe in the book was, was for grandma because she's the one that got me started baking pies. And so it's the pure rhubarb pie. <laughs> And of course, for those of you who are saying, but what about the strawberry rhubarb? There is a strawberry rhubarb as well. <laughs> Erin, while you've got the book, um, could I ask you to show um, that picture of the, the butter um, yeah. cutting in? I think it's page 27. Thank you. <laughs> I'll put that, I might put it overhead really quick. I think yeah. it's here. So, there we go. So, here you can see the like the dough is actually even a different color. It's really worked in and become quite yellow. That's the dough for decor, mealy. And we have reference photos like this throughout the book. Um, also for the hydration, there's a side-by-side -side of a properly hydrated dough next to one that's too dry, next to one that's too wet. Um, I can find that one for you too. Because you know sometimes it's difficult to know what you're doing wrong without seeing it right next to the right. So here we've got a great photograph that shows um, this is like just right. When it's too wet, it's even lighter in color. And when it's dry, it kind of has these crumbly bits. So um, yeah, there's, there's lots of that, that goodness. And the cool thing about that butter incorporation that we talked about is also the final texture, which I was trying to find really quick before I leave this overhead shot for you again um, because you can actually see how it bakes up just completely differently but that's the same recipe all of those so up top here we have the dough for decor and you can see it's really tight and fine the mealy dough is a little bit denser flaky dough in the middle there then those bottom two are when you incorporate these two down here when you would start incorporating those folds or your extra flaky dough or your rough puff pastry. Very, very cool. <laughs> well, Erin, thank you so much. I'm very sad that we can't try the pie that you made. It's gorgeous, um, but- oh, I'm sad too that Seattle. I'm not eating it in front of you. <laughs> I know it's very polite of you. I can't believe it. I would be eating it. So um, thank you so much. The book is, is really wonderful. And I know that everyone will find a ton of information there. I was really blown away with sort of the detail of a lot of these things that I don't think many pie recipes talk about. Um, so, so thank you so much. And thanks oh, for chatting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And um, just, I love seeing what everybody's baking up. You know, my goal with this was really to kind of answer a lot of those questions that people have about this subject because I think people think it's it's a lot harder than it actually is. And if you can get in the kitchen and bake some pies and get some muscle memory, the next thing you know, you're gonna be the pie baker in your friend group. And that's good because I need someone around here. If you're in New Jersey or New York City, I need someone to take some of the load off of me. My neighbors are, uh, are wearing me out over here. So. <laughs> Aaron and Rachel, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in.
The book on pie is available at booklarder.com. Erin, there was so much love in the chat for that sturdy pie. I think everyone, you know, I think you you got some people to start posting those pictures, I think. Um, so expect uh, lots of sturdy pie in the next few weeks. I thank love you everyone it. for tuning in. And Erin, um, again, congratulations. And thank you, Rachel. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Bye.